Amai Wallach is an art critic, commentator, and filmmaker. She has written or contributed to more than a dozen books. Her feature-length documentaries, Louise Bourgeois, The Spider, The Mistress, and The Tangerine, co-directed by co-directed with the late Marion Kajori, and Ilya and Emilia Kabakov enter here, remain international in international demand. She's currently completing a new film, Taking Venice, The Rauschenberg Factor, which chronicles the intersection of art and inter international politics when Ra Robert Rauschenberg became the first American to win the Lion d'Or in painting at the 1964 Venice Biennale. Her articles have appeared in such publications as the New York Times Magazine, The Nation, Art in America, Art News, everywhere. Uh, she was an on-air arts commentator for the PBS McNeil Lehrer News Hour and chief art critic for New York Newsday. She is also President Emerita of the US chapter of the International Arts Critics Association and founding director of the AICA USA Art Writing Workshop, a partnership with the Andy Warhol Foundation and Creative Capital Arts Writers Grant Program um, in service of international artistic cross-pollination and exchange she serves on the board of CEC Arts Link. Uh, Amai, take it away. So it is wonderful to be part of this conversation today. I mean, for one thing, I think that this new social environment talkathon, I had to look up the, the name of it, um, <clears throat> is just yet another way that the Brooklyn Rail and Fong Bui are bringing communities, creating communities and bringing them together. And it's great to be part of these daily lunchtime talks. It, particularly since um, there are a moment of optimism and hope in this complicated time we're in, which art is, and in particular today's subject I think is, because today's subject is about children and how the arts open their eyes, open their curiosity, open their minds to process and make them able better to engage with the world. And so it's quite wonderful to have Tom Cahill, who is actually the founding executive director of Studio in the School since 1977, and Allison, um, I'm terrible at names, Allison Scott Williams, who has taken on that job as of March 9th in a very, very complicated time. So, you know, Tom, it's so interesting because you were, you were a practicing artist yes. and you were teaching art at the Brooklyn Museum right. and in graduate school. And you were tapped when Aggie Gund and together with um, Patricia Hewitt in 1976 decided because the arts had been cut out of, um, of New York City schools as the arts are increasingly done every once in a while that she and, and Patricia would find a way by founding this thing that is now a studio in the school to bring it back in. And they looked for somebody who could be an executive director, and they were smart enough to find this graduate student, Tom Cahill, because starting with two or three schools, it is now in, and I have written this fact down. I got it from Lily Way's really good article on Studio in the School, which is a recent one, Brooklyn Rail, and anybody who wants to know more might really want to go back to it, although they won't need to go more after this conversation. Um, but um, it's now in 193 schools and sites, they say, so perhaps not always schools, with a thir serving 32,000 students. I mean, it's remarkable. And so a few years ago, Tom started expanding this into a national program. And now he is the president of the, what is it called, Tom? The Studio Institute right. and runs this national program. And therefore he brought on Allison. <clears throat> <laughs> and it's, got, it's a really interesting passing of the baton because Tom started out as a practicing artist, visual arts, and Allison comes out of music, comes out of music and opera. And um, her, her, for many, many years, she was with Juilliard. And I have your title, Allison, but I'm, I'm let me see if I can find it here. Um, uh, you ended up, after many, many things you did, being Associate Vice President for Diversity and Campus Life at Juilliard. You'd been there for 14 years before going to the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, NJPAC. Um, and when you left to take on this job, 
John Shriver at CEO uh, called you transformative. So I find that, you know, a really interesting. Um, I will tell you personally, I um, helped found something called the Art Writing Workshop mm -hmm. for the International Art Critics Association, which is this partnership as with, with Creative Capital and Warhol. And after 10 years, I decided, you know, it's really time for someone else to transform this program and we have just named Jennifer Kabat to that and that will be her job. So I'm going to talk in a minute about COVID-19 but right now I want to talk about this moment between you Tom and Allison about how how is this a trans what, what do you see as transformative on both of your parts? I think we really share a common belief uh, and I think the board was so wise in finding Allison uh, we're really committed to children first at studio mm -hmm. and schools or as an organization. And I think that our, uh, our core belief in the power of artists to transform education is something that's come directly from Agnes, directly into the work we do. And the joy for me is seeing it actually, uh, knowing it's gonna continue uh, with Allison's leadership. Uh, we have a lovely exchange already and it's, it's great to have another mm -hmm. colleague. Yeah, and we're both really dedicated not only to the children we serve, but the communities that in which they live. And so I'm, we're wonderfully um, connected in our approach and what in our value system. So it really enables Tom and I to continue to you know push the vision and to broaden everything we do to reach more students. So it's really been a wonderful partnership. But I, I hear that. I'm sure it's a wonderful partnership. But I bet, Tom, you see things that you feel a new person would do in a different way. Um, and, and Allison, you see things that a new person could do in a different way. And that's probably what will happen. It's, it's the joy of having something that's not fixed in time, but really focused on a core element. One of the things that I think is very unusual about studio as both organizations uh, that are under studio, is that we're responsive to our communities, as Allison said, and that we really, at time, haven't gotten stuck. Uh, the bigger picture here has how to be uh, an important resource to schools and communities, how to provide access to art, and how to make sure that kids have it and learn about art while they're still young, so perhaps they can engage in other ways throughout their life, whether as a career or as a citizen. And I think being flexible about that means over 40-something years, really looking at ways of being a partner to the city. Mm -hmm. Allison is coming in at a time when she is up to here in a crisis for New York City. Uh, and Studio has weathered other crises and has always been a good partner to New York. So I think that mm -hmm. that's the core that if, if you know who you are, you change with the times, but you don't lose your focus on artists, communities, and children. Well, that actually is a great segue because you started your job March 9th. President Trump declared <laughs> stay at home, hopefully, <laughs> March 15th. So you, you, you jumped into the crisis. How did you do that? Um, with calm <laughs> and with kindness. I would say um, it, the most immediate thing was really for us the safety of our artists the safety of the team that supports studio, who are wonderful, wonderful people, and thank you for a wonderful team. But really it was about making sure that the children that we're serving, you know, that the if the teaching artists really, you know, felt like they needed to stay at home and they needed to take a moment, really give that latitude. So just as an organization, we did that. And then within, I think, two weeks with the amazing team that we have, we were able to create um, a new program of digital learning called Studio in Your Home. So within you know, two weeks, we were dexterous and flexible enough to create an entire online profile and so that schools had something by which to share with teachers, to share with families, and with the understanding that the most that one would have at home would be a pencil or some sort of writing utensil and a piece of paper. And so our very creative visual artists were able to create lessons 
around, you know, drawing lines, around, you know, shaping paper. And for us, um, it was uh, really a lot of work very quickly, but we're, again, very fortunate that we were able to just um, take this and turn it around and begin to support the schools in the way that they needed the support. So the schools are doing it, not artists. No, the, the artists are doing it in, in collaboration with the schools. How does so, that work? So there are some schools that will invite our artists to come teach within their Google Classroom platform that they're using to give instruction to all the children in their school. There are some school settings where they would like our video and they would like their classroom teachers to use our art teaching video as part of their class's lesson for the day. Um, we also have a daily prompt um, that is on our website so that you can go in and draw yourself, you know, it's self-directed. And so within this, we're able to adapt the way that we um, share art instruction according to what the school is most comfortable in doing, but it's still the studio in a school teaching artists teaching the lessons. And your students actually, although many of them are Title I, do have internet? From what we understand, the DOE has had um, executed an aggressive plan to get laptops and internet um, hotspots to children in schools. Um, there are some areas of this of New York City that, that where that's still going on, from what I understand. But um, the attendance rates, you know, have been like seventy percent or so. Last update I received. <laughs> So why, why is it important to teach art in schools? Well, at its core, art is really about self-expression. I mean, our, our curriculum is structured in a way to produce questions and it's, it comes from inquiry and it's about student voice. And so as you're answering these questions, as you're thinking about what is it that's important to me and how do I express that on paper or how do I express that in the medium we're working in today, whether it be clay, whether it be pastels. It's a way for me to express my voice without having to use words. And that also contributes to critical thinking in other subject areas. We quite often are teaching artists here that, wow, when this student comes to your class, we hear he or she talk all the time, but then they get back into my class and they say nothing. And it's really because we've created a space where their voice is most important and where their voice is at the center of what's created. So from my purview, the studying of the arts is really about self-expression, student voice, and really um, tapping into creativity. And there are not many subjects in school that will do that in the same way. And I also think, uh, just to add on what Allison's saying, that each art form is, is a part of who we are. It's the way we experience the world. Uh, whether, you know, if you, it's a sense. And for us, the sense of teaching art is about cultivating from an early age observations, cultivating a response, sharing a work, uh, working with your hands, not just doing what you always do in school sometimes, which is just a, a task, but actually using your hands and your head together with your feelings. So there's a lovely combination that art brings to a school uh, that it's not just problems that you're doing, but you're also, as like David Perkins has said, you're not just problem solving, but artists find problems. And that's what you see in the quick response, the wisdom of Aggie's choice of artists. It was really out there when this happened 43 years ago. Schools were very closed places. And I think the, the uh, qualities that artists bring to this work and the dedicated administrators at studio that cultivate that talent, it's really something that uh, is, it, the whole online learning is a great example. Quick on their feet, hardworking, dedicated problem solvers. And, and that, that, that person in the school is such an important part of the community. So, um, so I'd love an example, for instance, of how you encourage somebody to have a voice. How, how would that happen? How would, what would be going on between the artist and the, and the kids so that they're able to say something or see something or ask something? 
It's about choice, uh, which is something that I think is really key. Everyone looks at something, uh, but we can have our own point of view about it. We can make our own choices about what we want to say about the same thing. And we can choose materials. So we learn really early on to shape our ideas and to share our work, uh, to value the work of others. That, that's why it's so key, I think. Uh, I look at one thing, I make something, you make something, I learn from you, you learn from me. Uh, there's a kind of community of learners in our rooms. Sometimes I'm not sure where your work stops and my work starts. Uh, that's something that artists know, for example. That, it just adds so much in terms of uh, the journey. For children, their work is really focused on their experiences in the world. And as Allison said, bringing that out. Uh, so it starts, the, their interests are close to home. And as they grow in art making and in thinking, the work becomes more detail oriented and it shows that richness. It's a wonderful journey of an expressive uh, pathway. You know, I know that you like to use the word process a lot. Yes. Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> You want to do it, Allison? I'll, I'll it. Well, I mean, I'll start by saying, you know, it, it's really, it has been my experience and our experience that when you focus on the process and what elements went into the process, usually the product is glorious when it all boils down to it. And so uh, both of, of our approaches, um, even in my prior workplace and even now, it's really about what are the, the parts, what are the questions, what is the inquiry? And then when you take the time to express yourself, usually the product comes out beautifully. I mean, we have some samples. Should we just show a couple of- Yeah, I think it'd be great. Um, that can, and Tom and I, and Tom will annotate and we'll annotate. We're gonna just show some samples of work in the classroom so that you can see um, what we're talking about. So, for example, here are self-portraits from some of our youth. There we go. Now, when you see a self-portrait like the one on the left, mm -hmm. do you try to understand why that person has that expression on their face and their hands up like that? And that's a choice you can make, absolutely. But in addition to that, I think this is a lesson that's actually uh, both about me and the way I look, but also about the power of nutrition uh, to support my life and thinking. So I think those are pineapples and something else that, are, that the child is digesting. So it's really, uh, the child is actually uh, learning about healthy learning. Part of a curriculum that was about getting kids to like fruits and vegetables and to make healthy choices. Uh, so that, that is an interesting example of how not just the expressive power, but the demonstrating of what I know and understand, and perhaps being able to see a different vision through art of how um, you go about nutrition or anything else in your life. But it does look a little bit, you know, like running while black, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, today, yes. Yeah, anyhow, go on. So no, if we, uh, the two different ideas in two different materials. That's the other thing, having choices, right. um, not having uh, two different ages. Uh, for a six-year-old, the, the learning is not uh, about how to say something about myself could be very broad and very expressive. And that's what you're seeing there. Whereas, you know, with the work of a nine-year-old, you're seeing someone who has precision because they've learned to cut and they've learned to frame their ideas and they know enough about details, as I was saying before, to make that expressive face with just a few material. Right. And if we can go to the next slide that shows the um, community, I think is the one. Yes. So you can see in this collage, it's, you know, these are the elements that are important to me that I see in my community every day. And so, um, you know, it's somewhat self-explanatory, but I think that um, there are many, there are parts of our curriculum that focus on, you know, what is in your world? What do you see? What do you envision? And so then you'll have a piece that's like this, um, that sometimes it's three or four students work together to create this. So when you first showed this slide, you said, this is my slide, community. Community has been something that's been very important to you in your career, right? 
Yes, community is very important to me in my career, and it's what I've dedicated myself to in that getting having access and opportunity for underserved children has been where I've dedicated my time. And when I was at the Juilliard School, I did it in supporting those kids from underrepresented communities who, you know, coming to a place like Juilliard was just foreign to them. So I spent a lot of my time um, being supportive of their journey and helping them to become the artists that they are today. Whereas here as studio, I'm able to do that to the thousands <laughs> that we serve in schools, but it's also um, really what I, the, I've had an opportunity to visit schools just twice since I've joined studio since, you know, March 9th. And in, in both of those cases, it's been really wonderful to see young students with, you know, the drive and the inquiry and knowing that our program is giving them the opportunity has really just helped to connect my values. So one of the geniuses of Aggie's idea, really, when you come right down to it, was that it's bringing art to where kids are, which is in the school, rather than kids, which is the way it always had been and is much, much more now, to museums or to New Jersey PAC or... or, or yes. Um, Yes, I also think that part of uh, that core belief that Aggie had that fills the program is really starting with uh, a sense that it's not just what you make. When I talk about process, at studio, all of us really believe it's a journey. But, but in fact, most people in the schools think of art as a product that's made. What will I make when we're done? It's a project. We understand as artists that it's connected to bigger ideas and, and developing skills. And that if it's art, everyone's is not exactly the same. So all of those elements are such a part of the program uh, that really was inspired by Aggie's belief in the artist as uh, a catalyst within a school community and a resource within the community. There's lovely partnerships between artists and teachers. There's schools that begin to see their halls change and become welcoming, at, at not like the prison-like structures that schools frequently look like. Uh, art is powerful, and when I see my work in the hall, I feel like I am part of a community of learners, mm -hmm. and, and part of a community, it's citizenship. So there's so many nice things. Uh, it, you know, in the early 20th century, there was a, a focus on teaching art and, and appreciating the masters. That's what art, art instruction was. Mm -hmm. Well, this is about your own work being valued and your own response to the community. Mm -hmm. And Thank you're you. and you you're really interested, Tom, in um in in one of the educators. I can't do names anymore, and mm -hmm. so I, I I throw up my hands. Um, who who sees um art as a way to social consciousness and social activism as well? Yeah, the whole American tradition in education, uh, that really uh is so unique to our country that took much more in the Midwest, by the way, than on the coasts. Uh, really is about a, an approach to inquiry and learning and discovery-based learning, uh, growing uh, before even we had the kind of psychology we have now. Uh, so yeah, John Dewey is an example of that. Uh, in my own life, I've been very influenced by a, a woman philosophy teacher at Teachers College, Maxine Green, uh, an existentialist philosopher who really believed in what does it mean to have the power of imagination and not to have the power of imagination. But if you have imagination, you can see things differently and you can see a future and you can see a transformative future. So a child may mess with pastels and paint the building a different way. Uh, but eventually a child who's a teenager can actually give a response to that community uh, with their own personal uh, take of what the future could be or what's wrong with where we are. Uh, can you teach imagination? I think you can set the context for imagination. Yeah. If you look at the arts, that's what I would say, that uh, you can encourage people to enjoy the novelty of making and what you find out sometimes when you're working. This is really the way an artist would think about it. I think where you, you start out with one way and then the material has an impact and you go another way. You think you made a mistake with a watercolor and all of a sudden you've discovered something about color that can be used in a different way. Mm -hmm. So you can set the context and the privilege and the idea that there's not one way to do it. That's, That's the right. Yeah. 
and and the mm -hmm. teachers are taught to see mistakes as opportunities yeah. like I was just about to say that. Yeah. yeah yeah i was just about to say that and that there are no mistakes like everything is leading you to the next thought so there there isn't a right or wrong it just this is what it is and now i'm going to think about this now that i've seen this new color that i've created just like tom described are you going to show more slides or should we go on and talk um, i think there may be one more community slide and then we can go back yeah there's one too so this Great. is a group project i think uh <laughs> about places in the city <laughs> Right. And uh, it looks from looking at it that somebody's looking historically. So there's right. a research piece here because Ebbets Field has been gone for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yes. so, so, but you can see the Williamsburg Bank, uh, a 1920s monument uh, from Brooklyn, uh, the, the arch at Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn. That's right. Uh, I don't know what the building with the flag on it is. So that's an example of something that's a secret. And then something that looks like going off on Coney Island on the side, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so really, right. for you, Tom, this must be old home week because I think your dad was a detective, your mother was a bookkeeper, <laughs> and they took you to all, they loved New York, and they took you to all these My things. My family right? loved New York City, and I have to say, it, it's, a, it, it was contagious in our household. Right. What about you, Allison, in your childhood? Oh my, my childhood was filled with a lot of music. I started going to the opera when I was about nine. And so, and by my request, I have to admit, it wasn't like my parents forced me. I was, I was also, I was a member of the Chicago Children's Choir and I got to tour the world, tour the United States with them. And so very, at a very early age, I could see how participating in, an, in arts and these exceptional experiences of being able to tour really informed, you know, my, me as an artist and as a growing artist. And so I think that programs like, you know, the Qu children's choir I was in or um, like the teen program we have at Studio um, Institute um, where Tom was able to take a wonderful group of artists to the Biennale you know, it's, it's those exceptional experiences really help to um, define and really fortify your commitment to something. And so at, in my childhood, it was very, I was very much connected to the arts. I knew I would always work in the arts. I just didn't know how and where. So should we I'll stop sharing the screen and, and yeah. see each other? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so hi, and welcome back. So yeah, the Biennale is an opening to something because of course we're seeing little kids, but this continues, right? Yeah, the thing about studios <laughs> focus on one art form is that we know children from age three to 23. Uh, we know the whole cycle and have different uh, responses. Uh, so at an early age, it might be about making an expressive connection. Uh, at a high school age, it might be honing your skills and, and beginning to think about what you do next. Part of that can be understanding that there are jobs in New York, in arts careers, that you can actually enjoy and work in a meaningful way, uh, that there aren't just jobs where you're stocking something or uh, doing retail work, and that the city is made rich by the kinds of people that are okay. contributors from our community. So we have a series of apprenticeships, uh, a different approach for a different age uh, with our teens. The teens apprentice with a master artist teacher and then teach in some camp. Uh, they give back to their communities and feel that power uh, that comes from being successful and resourceful uh, member of, of, a, of a team. They uh, get paid, which I think our kids really need very much. Uh, over the summers, uh, it, it's not an option for many of our students just to have an experience. They don't lose learning because the way we build our programs they look and respond and write and learn to work in teams. Those apprenticeship approaches are, are something that's been passed down to us since the Middle Ages. Uh, and then when it comes to careers in the arts, we have a college program uh, for students that are upperclassmen and where they can actually get immersed in museum professions. And that was something that uh, Aggie started independently of studio and school uh, 21 years ago. But what it does is it takes students with economic need and provides them about $4,000 of summer income working in a cultural institution. And our audience has need and is diverse. 
And it's really an exchange between those cultural institutions and our students. You wouldn't know if you hadn't worked in a museum that there's a job like a registrar's job or that there's uh, public programs and, and, and school programs. You wouldn't know what a curator really does or a designer. Our idea is to introduce talented students with interest to the, into those jobs. So can you give me an example? I want examples here. One of them is I want an example of someone who didn't go into the arts but can really specifically say what I'm doing now was influenced by that experience. And then somebody who did get a job in the arts. Absolutely. So uh, last year we had the opportunity to work with uh, Martin Perry's exhibit uh, through a partnership with Madison Square Park at the Venice Biennale. Um, those students uh, were college interns uh, that went to Venice. They, were, they worked in the galleries there as interpreters. Uh, they met the public from around the world, you know how the Biennale is. And then they, um, they also gave back to the community there. Of that group, um, two of them are already, one is employed by the Cleveland Museum, and uh, one uh, man was uh, just employed by Gagosian this year. So there's an interesting pathway that can come from that. Now, there are many fine applicants. This morning, I filled out an application, a, a response as an employer for one of those students who's going on into an education field. So you, there's a, many of the students go on to uh, not just the arts, but to social service work. Uh, and that's what we're finding in some of the research that we've done that this introduces people to our community, which is so committed, that it makes you realize I can have committed work even if I don't have arts work, but I can do something that has social value. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have any politicians gone through this program? <laughs> <laughs> well, if they had, in fact, one of the crises that we're facing at the moment is the first thing that happened to New York City is it cut summer youth employment funds. Right. The first move. So I think one thing that's about these times, back to, to Allison's seat in New York, is that we were created 43 years ago in a crisis, but we have to be careful right now, decisions people make for students. You cut a 3% or a 5% cut from a school, you're taking away people. You're, right. you're increasing uh, class size. You would thin the day down, arts and sciences and social studies get pushed out. So right. I think we're at a time where we have to all be looking at the kinds of education we want, and insisting for it. Summer youth employment on top of three months now of what Allison described of kids maybe not working as, as much as they could or having trouble getting started. Summer youth employment could be a means of helping kids not have that kind of gap as they go back to school in the fall. That's right. What are they gonna do at home and on the streets if they can't have the kind of jobs that were there? Right. In our case, those jobs are, are, are the skills that we're cultivating are art and technology skills. So we hope that the city really re-examines re that. Uh, yeah. I, and I'd also, I'd also like to add, um, you know, we're partnering with the depart with the DOE, with the New York City DOE, to offer a two-week. There's usually a boot camp for middle schoolers in order to prepare them and prepare their portfolios for them to apply for high school, and it's been traditionally run for you know six weeks you know, or um, five to six weeks over the summers for the last few years. But in what we're facing right now, the DOE is changing that to a two week model. And we actually are one of the partners who said, yes, we'd be happy to have instruction and we'd be happy to give instruction to those 200 kids that have applied and would like to study the arts this summer. And so I think being able to step out and understand that Children shouldn't have gaps in their education just because we have this crisis going on. And so it, again, furthers our commitment to the students and to their learning so that we don't experience the gap for those who really want to look at their future in high school and really would like to, um, you know, study arts when they're, you know, for their grades 9 through 12. So I think we're an organization that when responding to crisis, we're student first, community first, and also, you know, really um, supporting the city at its time of need. But what about you know, so, many, so many museums you're letting people go, for instance? Um, so, and they're in deep trouble. Um, how, how, how are you dealing with this summer? How are you dealing with those issues and in the coming year? 
for the internships, it's become about virtual learning. We may not be able to have the kind of summer internship that has this incredible placement in a site, but we can have projects and a mentor at those sites and work virtually. We can still use and hone our skills as college students or high school students. So that's the way we're going about it. And the plan at this point is for the teenagers uh, in, in the program to actually work with uh, and, and do their own little online pro, uh, 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 uploads to be shared with the community uh, to, to continue to hone the education skills that they were, they were developing uh, and also to continue working in teams creating a product because that's what the modern workplace is. Uh, we want to be sure they learn those skills. Allison. And I would also add that um, First of all, I think the Metropolitan Museum is opening in August. Didn't I just read that in the paper? <laughs> but with that in mind, um, a lot of the exhibitions that we would normally have in June, we already have dates in October to um, remount some exhibitions of student work from New York City um, that will be mounted at that time through our PS Art program. And then in addition to that, um, we have scheduled already and uh, this will be launched probably in the top of june an exhibition a virtual exhibition through christie's that will be the work of our littlest learners so these are pre-k through about third grade um, and we have about i think 60 works that will be in a um a digital virtual gallery that will actually feel like you're walking through it um, and that should be launched and you can look, um, come to our website in June and just click a link and it will take you to that um, part in that area of Christie's website. So I think we've been able to partner with the museums in a way that um, doesn't impede on their finances, but it allows them to connect with communities, connect with children and still let the work continue, but just in a way that we hadn't imagined before this moment. And will the kids be paid? Our kids are for the, the high school and college high schools. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's really a key part of this that um, to have a well paid job and to have the responsibilities of that job, uh, it's a real learning experience. And, and uh, so many times that access is limited uh, to middle class families and the kind of access points uh, that middle class people have. Our focus has always been at studio on students with need. And it's basically from the youngest through college. I do worry, though, uh, right now about the environment. And I, I think this, you know, as an arts community, what I love about uh, the Brooklyn Rail uh, series is, is that we're coming together. And I don't think we can be invisible. I think that, that arts and culture really matter. And I worry that, um, that decisions that are made will bump our teachers out of schools. The ecology is, is, is an ecology that we've worked over 40 years to build. Our board has been so dedicated to this. We've, and we don't want to be to have decisions made indirectly that remove all the arts teachers from the schools again. Mm -hmm. We don't want decisions made that are uh, shortening the school day and that's enough. It's not enough. So I think we have to really be, uh, as we recognize the city is fiscally in a crisis, but we need to get federal support and other kinds of support that ah. recognize what happened to this community. So, so how are you going to get federal support? Well, hopefully the cities will be able to do that. But I, I think that, that there's no way to avoid it, obviously. I don't think that no matter what the policy is, we, we've been hit harder than any other community. Uh, but I do think that uh, that we federal funds, but it's a question of how many of the funds or how they get distributed. Uh, the schools are going to need that to operate in the fall. We're all spending money like crazy trying to move online. We were we were not all working on iPads and laptops, you know, in the school system or in our in our in our programs. So. Right. But it continually, the money is cut for the arts. I mean, right? It was happening in 17, 1976 when Aggie saw the need, and it it happened right after the two hundred eight crash. It happens over and over and over again. But the city hasn't ever lapsed back to where it was, and that's the beautiful right. thing about the, both the, the art and culture community here. I work uh, in my new job in different cities where that structure is not in place. Right. Uh, it's very interesting to see what the New York art community has done here. And that makes me very confident about our, our future in New York, but a little worried sometimes about the other cities. Uh, and I would add, you know, having just worked in Newark, um, it's, 
it's about building the infrastructure for the arts so that when a dip happens, we don't have to go back to square one. Right. You know, we can, you know, kind of take two small steps back and then go forward. And I think New York has been an exemplar um, in that and Newark as well. Um, with just the building of the NJ Pack in and of itself was, you know, a miracle of miracles. So I think that I totally agree with um, Tom in that, you know, it's not like we're going back to square one. We still have, you know, 10 squares on the block. We're just losing a couple and we can regain them and move forward. And I think a lot of the um, articles or conversations I'm having um, or participating in with our with the cultural calls of um, New York City every day, um, every, everyone is, shares these concerns, but also we agree that we are much better having these conversations and uniting and versus kind of staying in your silo and being afraid. So who's so, everybody? Right. Who's everybody, for instance? Oh my gosh, these cultural calls have about 180 um, arts organizations around New York City on them from um, Harlem Stage, the Apollo Theater, Harlem School of the Arts, to um, someone from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It, it varies. And also there are um, representatives from Jimmy Van Bramer's office. So it's a, a real big conglomerate of um, arts and culture organizations that are on um, this, this call every day at three o'clock. Um, and it's been uh, moderated by Taryn Sackermore, who's with the Queens um, Theater. So listen, how do the art critics get involved with this? Because we've been looking at our members um, and they're hurting. I mean, there, there's no work. And, and the few, thank God for the Brooklyn Rail, the few publications, you know, have allergic to a few publications are hanging on by their teeth, but every day there's another one that we lose. And the, the art critics are really part of the community because they, without them, how does the meaning of an exhibit get out there? So, um, uh, we'd like to be part of that, actually. <laughs> right. And that, that is a DCA program, I think, that was organized. And again, the city has a strong structure to support the arts. Uh-huh. Uh, Department of Cultural but, Affairs. But, yeah. but it sounds like you, you're one of those professions that you absolutely have to find. Uh, I'm sure there'd be interest that will come out of this, actually. Right. I mean, one of the things that, that we've been very fortunate to have is foundations that have stayed with studio in a school, whether it's New York City's program or the Institute. and uh, and that makes it different than some of our partners. And I, I really, I, I say that because we, we know we can go forward in a way that many organizations right now sometimes suffer. Right. Like our team program uh, has a great partnership with uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies and they're committed to those kids. So I think there's a kind of, uh, they haven't backed off and certain foundations have called and, and, and offered assistance. But for the school system's challenges, it's going to take the public saying, no, we have a different vision of our schools. Right. And with the support and the public, of- How do you get the public to say that? I'm sorry. No, go ahead, you say. How do you get the public to say that? We need, we need art in our schools. I mean, well, I, what do you think, Allison? Well, I mean, basically, I think it starts kind of top, top down, bottom up. Right. Bottom up is really your local principal, your teachers engaging, saying this is what the value of this is for my home, for my child. I need it. But then also writing your local congressman, writing your local um, you know, senators. There's been mm. writing campaigns. And I think the more that they hear, the more that they see it's valued. I mean, you, um, you know, when the governor put together a group of um, thinkers to think about how the city would reopen, there wasn't a person in the arts on it. That's right. And because we kept writing, 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 now there's a person from the arts on it. So I think, you know, the, you know, people may not think their letters make a difference, but it's the volume and it's the message that, you know, we're not, we want, we have to be included. We are part of this conversation. I think it's very important for our um, industry and for you know, our children to have dreams and to be able to fulfill their dreams. I mean, think of New York. I mean, already there aren't going to be any more stores, any more small stores. Um, there's probably not going to be a lot of commercial space. Every, every, you know, these companies are going to learn that people can stay home half the time. They're not going to need the office space. Mm -hmm. Small museums are in deep trouble. Yeah. Without the arts, what is New York? 
Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really. So, um, you have? Do you have a video you want to show about COVID nineteen? You said that about studio in the school. You had a video you wanted to there show. Two examples of some work that's been done, both in New York and we could share those slides. I think, right? There's slides, not a video. Yeah, yeah not a video. Yeah. So, uh, Allison, do you want to? Let's see. It's the first one. I think is Allison's. Okay. Yeah. These are samples of our um, teaching artists who are within their the career ad. They are active practicing artists teaching within classrooms. You see um, working with clay and you see on the other um, photo of basically a kind of pastiche of three different images that are put into one drawing, right? And, and one of the important parts of our instruction is that the students actually present their work to one another and they are taught how to um, not only how to present, but to how to give helpful comments and how to critique one another, which is also such a, a great part of learning and helping the child with their social emotional development in terms of their self awareness and also their management and, re and the relationship between their colleagues in the classroom. We can go to the next slide. But this is not COVID 19. It's pre and even in, um, it's not in person during COVID-19, but this is an example of the lessons that we're now doing digitally. <laughs> it's a lovely picture, yeah. Mm -hmm. We can go to the next slide. And the next one. <laughs> Sweet, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there's the next one, right? There we go. And next. Well, this is the slide of uh, Martin Currier's uh, exhibit at the Venice Biennale. And uh, these are the interns uh, in the t-shirts, the black t-shirts with community members uh, from a local shelter uh, that they worked with. And uh, these families uh, and, and children uh, were at the Biennale that takes place in their city for the first time. Uh, but they also really gained this incredible knowledge of uh, Martin's work. The value though of the teens really, uh, of the college students, excuse me, really was that they cultivated relationships with this community. And in some ways it's the loveliest form of art diplomacy. Uh, the Biennale itself is, but what they did in the community was just such a rich uh, version of that. Uh, and the topics in Martin's show were complicated and uh, they answered questions from the public. I think there's some more of this uh, to look at. Uh, this is JP uh, working with the students and JP is actually at the Cleveland Museum now. Uh, and again, getting them to look closely at Martin's sculpture to answer their own ideas about his work. And uh, those of you that know Martin is an artist, he doesn't want people to know. But in, in fact, all of us should, should, he doesn't want you to say the meaning of his work, he wants you to find the meaning. It was very well suited to studios philosophy and to cultivating those looking skills uh, in, in the kids. That's a gift left there in Venice. So. Again, the same thing, uh, students in the galleries, um, their own responses to the work. And the next, yeah. So this is, you know, like I say, it's, it's just lovely to see a student that has, uh, uh, this is Amber Rose working with the students uh, and they're, uh, it's like a, a home, so the kids are different ages. Uh, but one of the things is that, you know, the joy in our life is to see somebody who has a, nat a, a natural uh, teaching ability combined with uh, the gift of being a talented artist and, and and that is something that I, that I think uh, we can look forward to see her develop as an artist and an educator, uh, something that you, we, get, we got to see this summer. I think this is a great place to, oh, here's one more picture. Yeah. Well, you know, um, one of the things is that uh, this is a COVID response. These are artists in Memphis where they don't have the digital equipment uh, and there's such a digital divide. So that's the thing about having these programs in different cities. And I think Allison brings a perspective to New York from Newark that's really important about social and emotional needs. 
and, and community uh, development. Same thing is true in Memphis and in Cleveland. Uh, there really are different issues. We're actually able to get iPads out to all of our schools, mostly, more or less. Uh, in a place like this, we had to actually, the artists created kits and the kits were distributed when families got packets of materials to take home. Uh, you know, there's a, a large percentage of the communities that only have a cell phone not, that don't have access. Uh, and I think actually Cleveland has the highest rate of, uh, of both poverty, but also uh, a lack of access to uh, internet in homes. Yeah. And a couple more slides of that. But this is, this is the artists that are actually working there that um, got together uh, with distancing to, to create these kits for families. And a nice packet of materials uh, of lessons that were sent home that were just created by the team so quickly. I see Aggie in the background there. Yeah, oh, yeah there she is. <laughs> Always a, are doing something good. Yeah, that's a picture from our open studio program where we get famous artists to come in and spend time and teach with um, classrooms um, here in New York City. And so, if I'm not mistaken, that's Glenn Ligon, right? It is. Yeah. Right. And yeah, there's Aggie sitting, <laughs> um, observing uh, there at the back. Um, and these classroom visits uh, really inspire the students. And for many of them, it's the first time that they realize that you can actually do this for a living. Hello. You know, they don't, they don't see people who look like them that are doing this for a living. And then to understand that this is actually your job. You know, it's the first time for them to shift their thinking about creativity and what I'm creating to actually, I could do this for a living. And that, that's really a tremendous thought. Most children, according to studies that I have paid attention to, decide what they're going to do for a living, usually by the end of middle school. So it's like, important. Look at the uh, um, expression on, on Glenn's face, you know. That's right. I yeah. mean, this is... This is the way an artist looks when they're <laughs> when they're interacting. This is absolutely. Great. And you know, Aggie, the president of the MoMA, mm -hmm. uh, to working in a classroom with kids, that's pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look in the background, this incredible uh, mural, yeah. which is obviously mm -hmm. a group piece, has something to do with cats. Uh, but I think what's fascinating about the the process uh, is that the artists gain so much from the kids. It's not a one way exchange. Right. The, for an artist who works alone or works in a, in a certain environment to be really brought into a community and to see the ways that what they know is impactful is just really uh, at the core of the studio experience. Sometimes they do things you can't imagine. Uh, you know, it's the kids' responses and their spontaneity is really inspiring to the artist. I think we should take questions, don't you? Yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, so we're just about ready for the Q&A session, but before we get to uh, our lovely questions, we have a message from Fong to all of you. Uh, it's not a message. <laughs> Thank you, Tom, Allison, um, and Amai. Thank you for an important conversation. For disclosure, um, many you know, institution and foundation and nonprofit I sit on, this is the most important to me. I'm part of the luminous, amazing board of directors. But I'm just gonna add a comment because Tom had brought up Dewey early on and it's very important to revisit him, his philosophy of pragmatism, which is essentially about learning from doing and doing from learning essentially in the act of making, in the act of creation, uh, which is very important to essentially visit the meaning of the word fact. Fact in all languages mean product of labor. So it's not alternative facts, like the way it's been circling around, opposite of what we care about. But I just want to extend it further, something that Picasso had once said that very important to remember that too. He say every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once you grow up. You know, and I think that's the idea of it all. Oh, artists are people who can recapture the power of their childhood at will. So 
referring to do it pragmatism, learning from all the unlike you is the essence of the, our so-called self-correcting democracy, which is being super fragile at the moment. But there are three stages. I just want to say this. So for you who don't really not that familiar with um, Dewey or Alfred Whitehead, a very important philosopher who invented the process philosophy. There are three stages. I just spell out very quickly. Process philosophy, there's three stages. The first state is what he called the state of romance. And then the second state is a state of precision and the state of generalization. It's essentially it's an ontology of becoming. That's a very thing that we should remember. A living organism which identifies metaphysical reality with change being the cornerstone of being thought as being becoming. In other words, the state of romance referred to immediate emotional involvement part of the learner, the spirit of inquiry, which is basically from pre-K to come into high school, you know, that's where you learn the most, you absorb the most, and you don't censor your excitement. The state of precision is really from the end of high school, going to college. That's when you try to complete everything, synthesize what you have learned and absorb what's surrounding the environment in the adult world and the state of generation, generalization is that's when the fruition, integration, both feeling and thought together. The opposite of what we've been trying to advocate for specialization in higher education. I don't understand it at all. So what we're doing at the student school is essential. That state of romance. And that's where it shines the most in the philosophy. Of this. And that's what's going on today because I feel perhaps, you know, the federal of the arts is in the making. Perhaps we need to revisit what happened in Work Progress Administration, WPA, when the arts humanity was taken very seriously because it applied to that period mm -hmm. during the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. So with that, I just want to make sure that we're going to keep the student school thriving in spite of what's going on because it is a time like this that we can mobilize slowness mm -hmm which require condition, natural condition, to what we do in art and humanities, as opposed to from deployment of speed. It's the opposite of what he's doing. So we have to bring together, and this is why teaching art to children is a sense of the moment. Thank you. Our next question comes um, from our very own Jeremy Zillar. Jeremy? You can unmute yourself. Oh, hello, hello. Um, I had uh, some questions for you around, well, as I come from home, where we're all homeschooling as well. Um, but I had some questions for you around, as an arts organization that obviously has to deal with the city and deal with bureaucrats and get funding. Um, and sorry for the businessy related question, but what, what metrics? Do you capture to show impact? Because I know as somebody that that is familiar with that, that's a hard thing to do in an arts and education uh, uh, program um, to, because people on the other side, they wanna see numbers change. And, or are there other numbers? Like I thought the metric that you said about Cleveland uh, was fascinating too. And that's a metric that then would enable uh, things that, so if you could, I'm just curious, like what are, what are some of the numbers that you use? Allison, do you want to go or you want to go? Well, I mean, I can start, um, I'll give you um, an example. Like right now we're in a, um, a program, we have a program that's specifically for multi-language learners and students with disabilities. And we have an external evaluator that is actually looking at the growth of the students, not only academically, but also looking at their social emotional learning growth. So I think that instead of, you know, having others tell us what our metrics should be as an arts organization, I think it's important for us to establish what are our metrics and what's important to us. I am someone that's grounded in 
the social emotional learning growth of a student by far um, can be measured based upon their self-assessment pre and post residency. And so I um, have come from a place and I plan on continuing this work here in studio where we're able to have a student self-assessment about their own growth and then using that you know, across 32,000 32, children in order to, for them to understand how have, how have I been changed now that I have had this art creation experience. So I think as an organization to have us define our own metrics and what's important, which for me is really based in their emotional intelligence because those are skills that they'll use the rest of their life. Right. It will help them be better collaborators. It will help them be better in the workplace. And so um, I just think as an arts organization, it's important that we determine this is our lane. This is what we measure. If you're on board with us, you're welcome. I know in terms of our work at the, with the older students, uh, we've gone out of our way to, to study the impacts. And for nine weeks of someone's time, you can make a huge difference uh, through relationships and through context. So we actually have seen and done studies that show the students are really learning not just art skills, but very valuable workplace skills. Okay. We've, um, and we've seen real changes in, in, in that. We're measuring the kids and their interest in going to college because to go further and to make a living, uh, you need to do that. And we're, we're tracking that. In the arts intern program, uh, we've seen really, uh, and done a study over a number of years, really looking at their engagement in arts and culture, as Allison was saying, like, if, it's, if it doesn't improve your interest in art, then we're in the wrong business here, and seeing how it sustains that in addition to, to careers. Uh, and they, they remain active uh, participants, and maybe the ones that don't do the arts will become museum board members and be successful in some other way. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. The Bloomberg uh, Foundation has been really, uh, the philanthropies has really been involved in studying how this impacts kids going on to college. And they, they support 75 interns uh, every year. So I think we're beginning to see how a bundle of arts experiences aligned with some other skills like learning to write and present yourself uh, are workplace skills that are, that are driven by the motivation of making art can it really uh, make a difference that's that's great thank you that's a it's fantastic to hear the it that we're drawing a line also between the importance of it to it being tangible in other spaces thank you next question is coming from kendra brown kendra i'm unmuting you now uh, am i on video as well <laughs> I guess I'll just ask something. Um, here, I can start the video. Um, hi, Tom. It was nice to hear background on you. Um, I've been very inspired by Studio's work as a professional art teacher in New York City, and um, I've been really appreciative of the resources that you guys have put out. They're amazing, and I really feel like they've helped break down this wall that has been created between me and my students. And I, you know, I do the screencastify, I present your, your resources, I, I show how the kids will use them and sort of engage with them. And I've really, it really has helped the work become richer. And I do art shares and Google Meets with the classrooms and try to have that art experience digitally. But I just really feel like there's this wall that's being built. And, I, and then the process, I feel like I'm also advocating for my job and what the, the, the new norm is going to be in the arts room. So I guess my question is, is how do you, and you guys have done such a great job, and Edible Schoolyard has some great resources as well. You guys in the schools, you know what's happening in the schools, you're able to create resources that are applicable to parents and students. So how as teachers, or how do we move forward? How do we continue to break down this wall? Like what are your biggest pointers? Because you guys have really, I think, done a great job with it. So thank you. Thank you so much. We, I think the, the thing is all of us to keep active, uh, like the team at both Studio and a school and Studio Institute. Uh, I think we have to be watching carefully about policy decisions and uh, particularly uh, paying attention to the budgeting process for next year. I, I don't think, I understand that the city is, is in, in a desperate situation, but I think our friends in cultural affairs and in different and social services, they understand the value of art right now. I've been struck 
about the power of drawing. All of a sudden, everybody understands what all of us already knew yeah. about focus, about relaxing, about healing. It's all over the place. Well, don't take it out of the schools then, because we're going to need this next year. We need <laughs> art teachers and we need artists that can cultivate that. I also would like to add that as an art, as you being an art teacher, you know, in a classroom, you know, there's usually, and I don't know how your school is structured, but there's usually one art teacher, right, for all the kids in the school. And so I think that our um, uh, education system, our principals, our leaderships have to think about when you're the only person that does that in your whole school, you know, what are the, the levels of connectivity that you need to make and to give you the latitude to make that? Because, you know, let's say just, you know, making up an example that school is going to be digital in the fall, right? You've got a whole new cohort of students that you have to make to meet and then to inspire their creativity based upon items that they have in their home. Like as, a, as an art teacher, you're already having to be 10 steps ahead of your colleagues, right? Because you're gonna have to do that for hundreds of you know, kids you know, across your school. And you know, we, we don't know, we, you know, but I think being able to um, place yourself in the position with your leadership in your school to think creatively about this, you know, maybe I'll start, you know, collecting toilet paper rolls. I don't know. In other words, you have to think about what are the lessons that a kid can do in their home just in case schools don't reopen in September yeah. and having all of us, you know, get ahead of that. Um, I think that's one of the biggest questions we all have. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think this is actually perfect because our next question is going to touch on those same themes as well. Uh, Ellen Wexler, I am unmuting you now. Ellen? Um, is Ellen Wexler there? No, she's gone away, I guess. She seems to be here, but I can't unmute her. So maybe in the meantime, we'll go to another question and then if she comes back um we can return to hers hi can you hear me now yes okay you can't see me i think that's the problem um my question is i have experience as both a a licensed and full-time art um, art teacher k-12 through and also an nea grant to work as an artist uh teaching in a school and um my problem was that uh, my experience was that the school systems used the artists, the teaching artists, to replace full-time licensed um, um, art teachers. Um, the studio and the school um, were wonderful artists, but they were low paid, they didn't have benefits, and there was, there was really, they were the only ones teaching in the school. Um, they weren't there to work with the art teacher. They were really there trying to replace the art teacher. And I think that the fault lies in, in the schools um, you know, not funding the arts and the art professors who were trained to be teachers. You know, Picasso was a genius, but I doubt he was a good teacher. So we really do need people who were trained art educators to be there and then to work with these wonderful artists that were coming in. So I was wondering what you think about that. I can tell you just historically that we've never bumped an art teacher from a job. Never that we have committed ourselves to professional development and partnerships. Uh, the prior uh, caller in Kendra can, can testify to that. We've worked for 40 years to see our teachers go from zero to where they are today with there's almost a thousand art teachers in the schools and have supported policy changes to make that happen. Our vision is a vision of artists and teachers working together and they provide different things. It would be a privilege to have Picasso come to your school so I don't think that it's one or the other. I, I think that uh, you, you can't see it that way. In terms of the studio artists, this is not meant to be a full-time career. It's meant to be their work for a period of time. It's meant to be their work not on a full-time basis. It's really important that we're bringing that perspective of making into the schools. Allison, I want to turn it back to you, but I didn't want you to get loaded with the past. So. Well, I mean, I, I, you've said it perfectly, Tom. I mean, we are not in the business of being a replacement for um, 
for an art teacher. And really, I feel like our work is grounded in the two paths like Tom described, one in giving professional development and supporting art teachers, and the other part of being able to um, provide services for schools. So it, it's, we are not, that is not the core of, of how we were founded and why. And so um, in general, um, we, it's just, you know, I, I don't know, our partnerships just don't, aren't devised that way, I guess is the simplest answer I would have. Thank you for those answers. It's very clarifying. Um, our next and final question comes from Aviva Ramani, um, who I will unmute now. Aviva? Yes, thank you. This has really been fascinating and really inspiring, and all your work is so important. We are in such a difficult period. How do you guys stay optimistic? about what can be done given the challenges we all know we're facing. We are or should be a culture built upon hope. And we plan for the best and see where we land. I mean, it's, we have to be um, rooted and grounded, I feel like, in knowing that as long as we're choosing on the, within the best interest of our children, of our community, of the needs of our school, then we have reason to be hopeful and we have reason to um, still, I don't know, wave the banner and drive the train in that what we're doing is not only valued and important, but essential to growth and creativity. And so, from my um, perspective, it's really, um, I, I don't know, from my perspective, we just, we have to be hopeful because if we're not hopeful, how do we expect the children to grow? Yeah, I, I agree with Allison. Uh, I really do that in our case, I've seen, I've been inspired by my colleagues uh, that have just immersed themselves in, in, the, in their commitment they've been working longer hours than you would ever imagine to make sure that they're not dropping their commitments to teens and to college students or to the schools we serve. And I see that in this organization as something that is positive, hopeful, that it's not gonna go away. I do think that we're gonna to have to learn and be, uh, there'll be an unsettling period where we're gonna to have to be visible to, uh, to manage some of the decisions that are made. No one ever makes decisions in the arts with the arts at the top of the list in this, within the context of higher ed, of education as a whole. So by in unintended consequences that could have an impact on, on, on schools in the fall and what they're like. But that will be a period that will be uh, just a short period of time. And then we'll learn to, to really adapt and, and find new ways of being successful. That's what art people do. I would also add, you know, I get inspired when I see um, the artwork of students that have tried our lessons and they upload them to our Instagram. So I get a little message, you know, because I follow Studio in the School on my Instagram, but every time a, a young person or even some adults who do our um, daily sketch prompts, you know, and they upload the photos of what they created, that is what gives me hope because it tells me just one drawing, one exercise at a time, you know, we're, we're reaching out and it's something that's important for all of us to continue, you know, looking for inspiration and, and sharing. And I would say, if you look at our Littlest Learners exhibition that's coming out in July, that will inspire you by all means. <laughs> um, that was incredible. Uh, so we have actually a couple more questions, but we'll just squeeze in one more, if that's fine with everyone. Um, our final, final question comes from Philip Ellis Foster. Philip, I will unmute you now. Philip? Let's see. Um, okay, I think we may have missed Philip for the time being so <clears throat> uh so 
from there, uh, so the, Dale has a, the rail has a daily ritual of ending lunch with a poem. Uh, today we are so lucky to have the luminescent poet Sandra Simmons read for us live from her home in Tallahassee. Uh, before she does, let me tell you a little bit about her. Uh, Sandra Simmons is the author of seven books of poetry, most recently, Atopia from Wesleyan University Press, 2019. Her poems have been included in Best American Poetry, 2014, 2015, and have appeared in many literary journals, including Poetry Magazine, the American Poetry Review, the Chicago Review, Granta, Boston Review, Clochers, Fence, Court Green, and Lana Turner. She lives in Tallahassee, Florida, and is an associate professor of English and Humanities at Thomas University in Thomasville, Georgia. Um, Thank you. Thanks. This was a lovely conversation. I learned so much. So um, thank you for all that you do with the arts. Um, I teach at the university level, but I know that it's just so important to get that education, you know, from an early age. And it's, I just, it was very inspiring. Um, so as you were talking and, and talking amongst yourselves, I tried to find poems from this book, Atopia, that I wrote that have my kids in it um, because there was so much talk about children. Um, so I'll read three short ones from this book. And also, thank you. I've never been called luminescent in my entire life. <laughs> I feel honored. Um, okay, so this is a, a book that has it's, there aren't separate titles, it's a book length poem, but they're separated um, out. So I'll just kind of briefly pause between each one. Everything is terrible. When I opened the internet, these are the kinds of things I would read. Then I looked away from my computer and over at my kids. The older one was teaching the younger one how to set up a chessboard, and they were fighting over the queen. My little girl couldn't sleep at night because she said her friend Stella's dog died and the ghost of the dog was barking at her all night. I said, Charlotte, dogs don't have ghosts. But what I meant was dogs don't have to pull things together the way we have to. Then I remembered the sign at the zoo that said, shh, the wolf is pregnant, so please be respectful. And I walked her back to, her, to the bunk bed and tucked her in again. This one has a lot of color in it in my kids, so I thought you might appreciate that this one. After bath time, Charlotte and I watch Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, a DVD I got at the university library for free. Ochre, shallow saturation, narrow spectrum of pale green dawn trying to corral giraffes into an area of savanna shaped like an arrow. These grasses, birds, this was another earth. My daughter puts up her little feet I read the steel report on my phone. Put your phone down, mommy. I've never felt so unsexy. Is this what it means to turn 40? I scroll through the document, wavy against the cracked phone screen. The wardens of the park say the giraffes will collapse. The diamond-shaped sky falls back down. It must be the early 1980s on this TV, judging from the colors. I didn't know the world changes colors slightly every decade. The technology shifts. And hourly, people type out codes to perform a dance with your neurons. These antidepressants have gone kaput and catapulted me into a news obsession. The wolf mother had four pups today. My daughter's asleep now. I turn off everything. Um, and I guess I'll leave. Um, this one doesn't have my kid. Oh, it does. Shall it? Oh, no, it does not. Okay. Uh, this, this will be the last one that I read. It's a spring poem. The red bird falls from the tree, lands on its head, 
rolls right back up on its feet. Hello, spring. Hello, sanity. Hello, trash fire century. Hello, wilted leaves and gothic vines. How are you doing? I will water the thyme today. I will make miniature succulents out of clay. I will bake you the most beautiful loaf of bread, eat half of it and give the other half to whatever nothing I can find. Pretend you are mine. How are you doing? doing? Thanks. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Um, I thought those were so uh, appropriate to where we are all, where we all are right now. Um, Thank you so much for uh, sharing your poems, Sandra. Thank you, Tom and Allison and Amai. Uh, this was so special. Um, please join us again uh, tomorrow for painter Matt B. Levenstein and art historian and host Jason Rosenfeld at 1 p.m. Uh, also feel free to unmute yourselves. It should open up now um, and say goodbye or thank you or any kind of greeting as you leave. Um, yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, Tom and Allison. Thank you. Really Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Thank, Thank you. you. That was absolutely Thank you. 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 It was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Fong. Hi. 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 He's trying to do something. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Matt. Hi. Thank, Thank you, Amma. Thank you. Oh, hi, Yasu. Looks like a boat. Hi, Yasu. Hi, Yasu. Hi, Hi. Wow. She's everyone here. Everyone's here. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hi, Yasu. Hi, Yasu. Hi, Yasu. Hi, Yasu. Hi, Yasu. Hi, Yasu. Hi, Oh yeah! Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah.